Good morning, everyone. I hope you had fun yesterday in the laboratory measuring EM modulus and unconfined, unconfined compression strength. Uh, today, we'll do one more exercise to measure EM modulus. And uh, hopefully, after that, uh, you, you'll see that it's a more or less a straightforward uh, process. What we're going to do today is to add one more thing that we didn't do here either in the in class or in the laboratory, and that's going to be to determine what is the Poisson ratio and how to measure that. All right, so let me see. We were uh, somewhere over here, right? And we already saw how to measure that Yam modulus, and basically we need to apply stress on one direction measure how the rock deforms in the other direction and that gives us the YAM modulus. Okay, so what we're going to do now is we're going to determine what is the Poisson ratio. And before we do that, before we jump into actually how to do that, I hope you have your computer. Uh, raise your hand if you have your computer here. Okay, so most of you uh, if you don't have your computer, uh, probably, you know, just try to work with someone next to you that has a computer uh, because we're going to need it. All right. Uh, so I don't have a figure for this, so I'm going to have to do it over here. Okay. Yesterday in the laboratory, you did a test in which you measure load and if you divide that, divide that by area, you get stress. You also measure axial strain, which was the change of length divided the initial length. And when you do that, and actually we use a cylindrical sample, and that last doesn't look very straight. Let me try one more time. Um, when you do that, uh, we deform the rock so that you got something like like this. And if you take here the slope of this curve, if this is equal to 1, this is going to be equal to the Yam modulus. Let's make it easy for now, and uh, let's just assume that there is loading. Yesterday, you did unloading too. Uh, all right, so we already saw how to do this. Most of you know how to do this, and we, we even uh, did it in the laboratory. All right, so what we're going to do now is we're going to add the second component, which is the Poisson ratio, and the Poisson ratio is going to relate the radial strain and the axial strain, where the radial strain is going to be equal to the change of the radius divided the original radius, or this is the same as saying the change of diameter divided the original diameter. And when we do these measurements, and I'm going to show you an example of this in a bit, we're going to be able to draw another curve over here, which is going to look something like this. Uh, uh, let, me, let me fix it a little bit. Mm. 
I need, I need both of these to be at the same height. All right. So this is going to look something like that. And here I'm going to have, this is the plot that we're going to do, radial strain as a function of the axial stress and the relationship between radial stress and axial strain is going to give us the Poisson ratio. So um, let's work on getting this plot and then I'm going to show you later how to get uh, the Poisson ratio. So this is what we are after. And remember that the Yam modulus is the change of stress divided <coughs> the change of strain. All right. So, um, and this is actually part of the, the new homework, which is due on, uh, on Tuesday. I was thinking about that. Probably I can make it due on Thursday, since you have the laboratory due on Wednesday, OK? So I'm, I'm going to change it. Now it's Tuesday, but I'm going to change it to Thursday. But y you will see that if you, we work this together, and, uh, and you can solve it in uh, less than half an hour, you're going to be done with that homework. All right. So this is what you have to do. Go to the problem section in chapter 3. And here uh, you will see that this is the first problem that we're going to, to solve. You need to click on that link where it says the data is available here. And when you click in that link, you're going to get to a data file uh, which shows a, an experiment of loading, measuring displacement in the direction of loading, but also perpendicular to loading, right? So I'm going to copy all this data. I'm going to open it in Excel. You can use any software you want. I'm going to paste it. Uh, it's not. I need to convert this from text to columns. And you already know how to do this. You can also download the file and then import the file as data. Uh, whatever you find better. And now I have my data in columns. So let me fix here the, the header. Actually, I like to put units in a, in a second, in a different row. So this is seconds. Here this is force. This is pounds. This is XA. And XA is going to be the axial displacement. And YA is going to be the radial displacement. Yes? Can you do the text to column thing again? Uh, sure. So here's your data, right? Don't do anything there. Just keep it selected. Okay? Otherwise, it's, going, it's not going to do that to everything. Then you go to data. You go to text to columns. You click there. Uh, you keep that choice of delimited. You press next. And then here you have to add 
the delimiter, which is going to be space. So just check that box, and you're going to see that these lines over here show up, meaning that now your data is going to be separated whenever there is a space in the file, in every <laughs> row. Sometimes you have commas, sometimes you have semicolons, so it depends on what is the, the file that you have. And then you press, finally, uh, you can press next or you can press finish. If you go next, then it goes with a few more things, the format of the text, but I'm not going to choose anything of that. Just I'm going to put next, and then I get what I had before. All right? So I come back over here, and I'm ready now to calculate again YAM modulus, and uh, now we're going to add the Poisson ratio. Okay, so for the YAM modulus, uh, it's the same thing that we did before, right? Let me add here a few more lines. So I add information about the sample. Uh, let me zoom in so you can see a little bit better. Uh, here I'm going to add <coughs> the length of the sample, the diameter of the sample. I'm going to calculate the area. According to the problem, the length is 2.01 and diameter is 1 inch. Okay. And so 2.01 diameter is 1 inch and the area is going to be the diameter square times pi divided by 4 and I can compute what is the stress uh, let me add one more line over here this is actual displacement this is radial displacement so okay stress uh, that force is already calibrated so you don't have to, to change it by any number so just divide the force divided the area and you're going to get stress. Uh, axial strain without units is going to be the change of length. Now this one, XA, because that's the one that it's in vertical direction, divided the initial length. and you copy that for all the columns and last you have the radial strain and here now you have to use the, ra the radial displacement so now this one divided by uh, subtracted by the initial value same formula just different columns and now I divide it by the diameter so this formula is using the difference in the change of diameter divided the diameter uh, I forgot to to lock that cell and you copy that and you'll get your result all right so do, do that, and uh, and we'll start making some plots. Okay. Oh, because I, I I know that from the from the equipment that we use. Actually, this test that that you have the data for it was done 
across the geomechanics, undergrad geomechanics lab. If, if you saw that room with a transparent uh, uh, wall, okay, well, that's my laboratory, and the equipment that you see over there is, is, a, is a triaxial cell, high pressure triaxial cell that allows you to do these measurements. All right, so let me, let me make this a little bit prettier so it's easier to, to look at and to understand while you work on that. So the axial is, this goes with that, and this one goes with this. <coughs> I'm going to start plotting things here, okay? First I'm going to do the plot I was telling you. That one. think let me check let me follow the same color red and blue okay All right, so let me know if you need any help. You, you should get somewhere over here, and then, then we'll continue. So something I, th I hope you, you know this is that the, the blue curve is going to the left because it's negative. It's an expansion, while the red is going to the right because it is a contraction. What was the, what was the axial point? So it's going to be the XA, right? The XA, yes. Minus the, the initial. Yeah, divided by the length. Yes. The length. Okay, so that's right. But why do I have different values? The oh no, it's I, th that's OK. Thing. It's just that those numbers are, are super small. So don't worry that they're a little bit negative. What about radial? It's just YA? It's the same. The change of YA mm -hmm. divided by the by diameter. Percent. You didn't lock the diameter column. The diameter yeah. cell. Oh, you, 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 you have to, to lock that. How did you say to do it? You, you said like F4? F4. F4. What do you mean? Um, but but you, need, you need to press another button in your computer to do F4. Yeah, function F4. There you go. Yeah. All right. So try to plot that, okay. and uh, you should get something similar to what you see over there.
type of formula where it's change in volume over initial volume? Um, for the volumetric strain, let's go ahead and do that. If you remember from what we discussed in the previous class, the volumetric strain was the summation of all strains. Let me come back to that. All right, this is volumetric strain uh, right here. It's the summation of all the strains. So in this case, uh, that we have a cylindrical sample, if we want to compute the volumetric strain, we have to add the axial strain plus two times the radial strain. Because the radial strain, it's the strain in one direction, but actually since we have a one plane, we, then we're going to have two. So the equation is going to look like this. And then I think I'm asking you also to plot this as a function of time. I don't remember if this was the assignment or not, but that's pretty easy. You can do that on your own. So volumetric strain is going to be the axial strain plus one of the radial strains plus, again, that radial strain, or two times that radial strain. Don't worry about the signs. It's everything. You have to add up everything. Some of them are, are negative. Then. Uh, that's uh, going to be considered with its own sign. Can you explain the reason for the two times the radial strain? Because it's not the Yes, uh, because here in the radial <laughs> strain, <coughs> when we measure axial strain is a strain that we get in axial direction. But when we measure radial strain, is the one that we measure in this direction, but also we're going to get the same in the other direction. And because we're dealing with a three-dimensional solid, we need three strains. So two of them are going to come from the radial part. So that's, that's why. Cylinder is with one L or with two L's? I always forget. One, one. one? OK. Uh, OK. Uh, so guys, I hope you're there already. Uh, if you want to measure the YAM modulus, we do the, you do the same thing that we did before. You throw a, thread, a, a trend line around somewhere over here, and you'll get the YAM modulus. In this particular assignment, and I am asking you to find the YAM modulus between 0.25 and 0.4 percent. So that would be. 0 0.002 and 0 0.004, right? So if we go over here, that would be somewhere around here. 0 0.025, that would be somewhere over there, <coughs> and 0 0.04. That's where you're going to take the loading modulus. 
And for the unloading modulus, you're going to pick one of these unloadings. And I'm, I'm pretty sure you can do this, uh, that you know how to do that. The Yam modulus we already saw how to do that. Now we need to measure the Poisson ratio. And if you remember from here, from the definition of the Poisson ratio, this is going to be the ratio of radial strain to axial strain. So what we're going to do in this case is going to be uh, something like this. We're going to plot the radial strain as a function of the axial strain and you're going to see something that looks more or less like that. And the slope of of this curve, if this is equal to 1, this is going to be equal to negative the Poisson ratio. Because it is the slope of epsilon r divided epsilon a. Let's see how that looks in the actual uh, problem. So I'm just going to copy this over here. <coughs> and I'm going to delete this one that I don't need and I'm going to change the y-axis from stress to radial strain and that's what you have over there and let me let me make it fit in here Okay, and I want, let me move this to zero. I want the slope of that line in just in the region between 0 0.0025 and 0 0.004. Okay, so let me see if I can do this quickly over here. But it's the same procedure that we did for the Yam modules. Just select the region get a trend line from there and uh, just see what is that number. If you were to do this manually, say in an exam, the only thing that you have to do is just draw a straight line and calculate what is the slope of that line. For example, if I were to, to calculate that very roughly, uh, let me see if I can do it with here with my stylus. So it will be more or less that line. And the Poisson ratio will be the slope of that line, which here it looks to be <coughs> negative 0 0.002 divided 0 0.008, that times negative 1. So that's going to be, in this case, 2 divided by 8, or 1 divided by 4, or 0.25. That's going to be the Poisson ratio I would get uh, from this case. So that's just eyeballing, okay? And if you have to do this again in, uh, in an exam, that's, that's how you, you would do it. Let's calculate now accurately that, that value. All right, so I'm going to uh, do the trick that I was using before. Uh, notice that here we have about 3,000 data points. So you, you don't want to do this manually. I'm just going <coughs> to guess that data start at 1,000. You can see that uh, you can go row by row and check where actually that starts, but I just want to do it here quickly. So I'm just going to guess that it's in between 1,000 and 2,000, the interval of interest. And uh, that's pretty close. Uh, I'm still grabbing one of the loading points, so I'm going to go to 1500s. And that's, uh, that's a little bit better. It looks like I'm still grabbing a little bit of the first unloading path. 
So let me go 200 more. And that appears to be too much. Let's do 600. OK, that looks good enough to me. And I'm going to throw a trend line. Display equation on chart. And that's pretty close to what we calculated just by eyeballing. So it's a negative value, right? Because this is just epsilon r divided epsilon a. But the Poisson ratio is negative, oh, negative 1 times that. So 0 0.25, 15. That's what I get from there. All right, so I, I'll let you work a little bit on that. And uh, if you have any questions, just, just let me know, and I'll help you out. And you, in the homework, you will also have to do this for the unloading part. <coughs> Let me check here if there was something else that you have to do. OK, the problem actually doesn't say anything about unloading. So it's up to you if you want to do the unloading part. Just you can take it as an exercise. Um, but uh, the problem just asks for the loading part. And just to let you know, this is a shale sample. So probably it's going to be stiffer than what uh, you tested in the laboratory, those sandstones and and limestones. Yeah. I'm plotting. How do I like easily just switch X and Y around? Okay, so close close that. Uh, so what do you just select here? You, what do you want to change? Oh, like you want to make another plot? Yeah, I was gonna do the. So just uh, click here. No, okay. just click there. Here. Just do no, just just here on the plot. Uh -huh. Control Control C, which is copy. Uh, move here. And control V, and there you have another plot. Now, for example, uh, that one, just delete it, just delete, and click on that one. And now you can move those uh -huh. to wherever you want. But just go a little bit up because you don't want this. Okay, just move it so they start at the same, in the same place. So yeah, you want to move this stress column. No, uh, do uh, the stress column. You want to move it to radial. So the y-axis is now stress. Uh, no. um, okay. Yeah. To radial. Radial. Okay. Um, yeah, I think that's it. Yeah. Yeah, yours looks a, a little bit different because your zero, your zero is over here, but in my plot the zero is a little bit uh, to the other side. Okay, wait, wait, wait. wait. Oh wait, axial strain, axial stress. No, I think, uh, uh, click here a sec. Okay, so the violet is X mm. and blue is Y, okay. Okay, violet, oh, okay, you, yeah, you, should, you have to change it, yeah. And okay. well, but now, yeah, yeah. Okay. the stress. No, that one is good. Oh, the stress. The stress. I mean, there you go. Oh. So, how do you flip the uh, axis? 
Um, I just uh, so select that. Usually, what I do is uh, uh, I just move this one temporarily to another place, and then move this one over here, and then move this one to the other one. There you go. Um, all right, I, I just was, <coughs> I wanted to show you this image. I'm, I'm going to show you why, why we're computing this young modulus and why this is important. Yeah. Okay, that's because... That always happens yeah. for some reason. Oh, no, no, no. Uh, there's a trick there. Yeah. If you select the entire plot, that you, when you move this, it's going to move uh, at the same time. You just have to click the data. Okay, this? And now, when you click here, the, the data. Yeah. There. Now you can move it separately. Yeah. Thank you. I just selected the region around here and threw a trend line. Yeah, I more or less, you know, I guessed. You're going from 3 to 15, you need yeah. to go 1550 to 2000 on that, and then the same thing on G. Something like that, yeah. Yeah. Um, but no, no, you look that line, the line catching. is catching the, the tail of the, the, tail of the un first unloading, so you have to move your selection a little bit Upward. further up. Yeah. Okay. All right. But we can, we don't, we're not doing it, we're doing it like visually, right? What? The... Because, do you want us to go just select the, the data set? and then uh, just confine that like manually to what whatever you you do that captures this range is fine okay 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 but you shouldn't catch that uh first and loading yeah well all right guys i think um uh, most of you are, are quite close to get the result, and then you, you can uh, can work a little bit more at home. Uh, that problem, together with another problem about uh, finding what is a positive direction of stresses in two dimensions, that's everything I want by Thursday, okay? We talked a little bit about the directions, positive and negative directions for this, but again, I, I encourage you to read the section that talks about that in the notes, and you'll see it's quite straightforward. Mm -hmm. All right, so let me tell you, why do we want to compute this Young modulus and Poisson ratio? Uh, we want that because in, in geological formations, usually we get uh, very strong variations of mechanical properties with depth. For example, here you see a sequence of carbonate rock, shale, carbonate rock, shale, and carbonate rock again. 
And we're going to see the objective that we have now is to use those mechanical properties, Young modulus, Poisson ratio, in order to predict what will be the stress profile in this region if you had strains that act horizontally on this package of rock and how that stress is distributed over here. And let me tell you the answer now. We're going to calculate it later. But when you have stiffer rock, that tends to build up more stress than soft rock. And that's going to be very important, for example, for hydraulic fracturing because some of these stiff carbonates with the higher modulus, they're going to be barriers for hydraulic fractures. And hydraulic fractures will tend to stay in these softer and uh, weaker uh, rocks. So detecting that in a wellbore, it's, uh, it's very important for many applications. Also, if you drill a wellbore or if you do hydraulic fracturing or some other things, uh, getting to know what is the variation of mechanical properties with lithology, with depth, is very important to whatever we do uh, after. All right. So in order to get there, uh, we need to now jump to three dimensions. And that's what we're going to do right now. All right. So we know that. Let me go to the next section. We know by now that if we apply stress in a given direction, like here in direction 3, a stress sigma 3,3, three, I'm going to cause uh, two strains, one in direction of the load and another one perpendicular to the direction, direction of loading. And if we want to put that into equations, this is going to look uh, like this. So let me move this over here. Uh, where is my stylus? Okay, here. All right. So, um, so um, if we apply, as we're saying, stress sigma 3,3, three, I'm going to get a strain epsilon 1,1, one, one, which is going to be equal, if you look at this equation, it's Poisson ratio, uh, uh, it's going to be uh, actually uh, epsilon epsilon three epsilon one one is going to be minus one times epsilon t three times the Poisson ratio, right? So this is going to be here negative Poisson ratio epsilon three three epsilon. 2, 2 is going to be also negative Poisson ratio epsilon 3, 3. And that's the other one that we cannot see now, but it's going to be the same because it's in the other direction that we're not capturing uh, right here. But it's going to be the same because I'm uh, assuming that the solid it's, uh, behaves the same in direction 1 and direction 2. And epsilon 3, 3 is going to be equal to, uh, we can see from the equation on the left, is going to be equal to sigma 3,3 three divided the Young modulus. That's if we apply a stress sigma 3,3. Three. But let me change this a little bit. Uh, we know what epsilon 3,3 three is. It's sigma 3,3 three three divided by the Young modulus, right? So I can replace this epsilon 3,3 three three 
and just put, uh, let me move this a little bit to the left, to the right. Epsilon 3, 3, I know it from the third equation, is sigma 3, 3 divided the Young modulus, and it's the same with this one. And it's just the same thing I had before, but now in terms of sigma 3, 3. All right. To this solid in which I have a stress in direction 3, I can also apply stress in direction 2 and have the other two that uh, other two directions uh, unconstrained. And I will have s the same equations as long as the solid is isotropic. Isotropic, with, which means it has the same properties in all directions. Something anisotropic, we're going to see later on, is something that does not have the same properties in all, in all directions. It depends on which direction you apply stress. But we're going to assume this is an isotropic solid. So if I were to apply now stress sigma 2, 2, I will get something very similar to what I had before. But now I will, ha I will have my contraction in direction 2 and the expansion in direction 1 and in direction 3. And if I apply stress now in direction 1, I will have compression and contraction in direction 1 and expansion in the other two. And by the rule of superposition, I can also apply those three stresses simultaneously with different values. And the resulting strains are just going to be the summations of the independent actions of each of those stresses. So now I have three stresses with different values acting in three different directions. And for all of those, just by assuming that this solid is isotropic, that it, it is linear, and that allows me to use superposition, I can get that the resulting strain is just going to be a summation of the independent actions of sigma 1, 1, of sigma 2, 2, and sigma 3, 3. All of those normal stresses are going to produce these linear strains or volumetric strains. Uh, or also we can call it normal strains, just to have an analogy with uh, normal stresses. But it's very important that you notice here that you might have, for example, a sigma 1, 1 and sigma 2, 2 equal to 0. And if you apply a stress in one direction, your epsilons, your deformations, are not going to be zero. Are going to be a value different than zero. That's because the property of a solid that uh, you push in one direction, it tends to expand in the other. So we tend to say that those strains are related to each other in the normal direction. OK. You remember that we had normal stresses. Sigma 1, 1, sigma 2, 2, and sigma 3, 3. But we also have shear stresses. And for shear stress, if I were to apply, for example, a stress sigma 1, 2, the relation that links stress to strain uh, is going to depend on the shear modulus. And sometimes I forget where the there is a number 2 in there. So let me see what it is. OK, there it is, a number 2. It's going to be epsilon 1, 2. Let's make it slightly different to what we have on the, on the left. It's going to be that. And 
I, I hope that you kind of see that the shear stresses, they do not interact with each other. So if I have a, a shear stress in direction sigma 1, 2, it's not going to produce a strain in the plane epsilon 1, 3 or in the plane epsilon 2, 3. So all of those are independent. They are not coupled with each other as with the normal ones. So those are just going to depend on their corresponding shear stress. And last, epsilon 2, 3 is sigma 2, 3 divided 2 times g where uh, now we have a, it's, it's new but it's not really new this parameter g g is the shear modulus and you can demonstrate I'm not going to do it here because it takes some time and you have to use some more circles so uh, I'm not going to do that, but uh, you can show that G is actually a combination of the Yam modulus and the Poisson, ra Poisson ratio. So if you measure those two, you already know what the shear modulus is. Okay. So now with all these equations, and let me switch now to here is the same thing. We saw where they come from. With these six equations now we can relate stresses to strains. All the six strains, epsilon 1, 1, epsilon 2, 2, epsilon 3, 3, epsilon 1, 2, epsilon 1, 3, and epsilon 2, 3, to the six stresses, epsilon 1, 1, epsilon 2, 2, epsilon 3, 3, I'm sorry, sigma 1, 1, sigma 2, 2, sigma 3, 3, sigma 1, 2, sigma 1, 3, sigma 2, 3. Normal strains and stresses are coupled and, in, and they depend on the stresses that are perpendicular to that direction. Shear strains just depend on the stress in that particular plane and they are uh, decoupled. Alright, so you may you may think that these are like too many equations and uh, it's kind of difficult to work with with the system of six linear equations uh, usually we, we, we don't want to do that uh, and it, it gets a little bit difficult to write all these six equations at the same time so an alternative to write these equations instead of writing it as a system of six linear equations is to write this as a matrix and as a matrix to vector multiplication and this is going to look like this where for example epsilon 1 1 is equal to uh, let me see if I can do simultaneously these two uh, no it doesn't allow me but it's going to be the first row times the column, right? So this one times that one plus this one times this plus this one times that one plus this one times this and so on. But notice for example that you can see very clear in the matrix that all of these are zeros which means that shear stresses are not going to cause normal strains. That's why those are zero the same thing over here uh, let's look at this one the strain in direction 1 2 is going to be this one times that one this one times that one this one times that one but those all of those are zeros which means that normal stresses are not going to produce shear strains the only one that is not zero is this one which corresponds to sigma 1 2 and these two are zeros too because uh, th those correspond to sigma 1, 3 and sigma 2, 3 and we know that those do not produce shear strains on direction 1, 2 so those are 0, 2 
So it appears to be longer, and you know you have to write more things. But if you are coding uh, these solutions, it's a lot better to work with matrices and vectors to use linear algebra than to work equation by equation. So that's why we do this. We write it as a matrix because it's a lot easier later uh, to code it and to use a computer to solve uh, some of these problems. All right. So we saw step by step how to get strains as a function of stresses. What would you do here if you wanted to get now stresses as a function of strains? Let me tell you, if you had, if we, if we were working with equations, you would have to solve the equations one by one in order to change, uh, uh, to move the, the independent variable to the left-hand side. But this is one of the advantages of linear algebra. What would you do here if instead of strains, you want stresses as a function of strains? Any suggestion? I know that you guys, you do not have a linear algebra class. But uh, linear algebra is very useful for all aspects of engineering, particularly now with data analytics. There is a lot of algebra involved. So if at some point, you know, you want to do some learning outside the classroom, uh, check some courses for, uh, for linear algebra because they're going to be very useful. Uh, in mechanics, we use linear algebra a lot. All right, let me tell you the answer. Uh, what you would do in this case, you will take the inverse of this matrix, and if you multiply the inverse of this matrix on the left-hand side times this matrix, and you do the same on, the, on this side, then stress is just going to be the inverse of this matrix, which will go over here, <coughs> times strain. And the result of that is this. That's this matrix. This one times that is the inverse of that. So now I can switch how I was uh, seeing this before, and I have stresses as a function of the strains which is, is the same problem, but now instead of uh, having as an independent variable uh, stress, now I have a strain. All right, so let's uh, see a few more things about this. Uh, remember that uh, the Shear modulus is just a combination of the yield modulus and the Poisson ratio. So actually, here, uh, this matrix, which is actually called a compliance matrix, just depends on two independent parameters. Uh, and that's very important because we're going to see that whenever we assume a linear isotropic elasticity, we just need two values of the solid to fully define the properties of the solid. And in this case, those two values are the Young modulus and the Poisson ratio. We measure those two, and then we fully characterize the material. If we take a look at the alternative version, now when we have here stress and here strain, this is called the stiffness matrix. The stiffness matrix, I, I hope that you see that the Yam modulus is in the numerator, so it's going to have units of pressure, PSI, Pascal, Giga Pascal, uh, whatever you use. The compliance matrix has units of one over pressure. And the stiffness matrix, again, it just depends on two values, Yam modulus and Poisson ratio. You know those two, you fully define the stiffness uh, matrix. 
here I have one more example that probably you heard about, uh, which are the LAME parameters. And the LAME parameters, lambda and, uh, and mu, they are just two other ways of characterizing the elastic properties of a solid. So instead of using Young modulus and Poisson ratio, sometimes it's more convenient to use lambda and mu where again lambda just depends on Young modulus and Poisson ratio and mu is, is just a shear modulus so mu is equal to g but with the Lam Lame uh, notation uh, usually it's called mu instead of g and when you use the Lame parameters this ugly stiffness equation with, uh, with lots of uh, uh, numbers and uh, and uh, fractions it looks a lot nicer it just looks like this it, it, that's why we use it we use the Lame parameters because you reduce the stiffness matrix to something much smaller so uh, you don't have to remember all this relationship about what is the Lame parameter as function of the Young modulus on po of Poisson ratio I'm going to give you those equations but also I like to point out the resource that I use actually very often because I don't remember these equations myself and actually you're going to see that there is not so we saw your modules, Poisson ratio um, shear modulus Lame parameter lambda Lame parameter mu Th that's five there are actually a few more and if you go into Wikipedia and you search for Young Modulus and you go to the very bottom, you will see a conversion table that tells you what are all the elastic parameters that we generally use in mechanics as a function of two other parameters. Uh, for example, uh, here at the bottom I have Young modulus and Poisson ratio, right? So uh, obviously the Young modulus is just going to be the Young modulus, Poisson ratio is just going to be the, the Poisson ratio. Here we have Lame parameter number one, shear modulus, and there are some other two other parameters that are also going to be very important, and we're going to see what they are uh, today or next week. And those are the bulk modulus K and the constraint modulus M and uh, one characterizes isotropic compression the other characterizes constraint compression which is very which is what determines P wave or sonic velocity so we'll see that uh, a little bit later on okay um, hmm okay Actually, there are some nice drawings over here. We know what is shear modulus. Lame doesn't have clear interpretation. Bulk, you see, is isotropic compression. Let's see for P wave modulus. I'm going to make a drawing for P wave modulus, so we'll see that uh, later. All right. Let me come back over here. Uh, this is a stiffness matrix with Lame parameters. You see it's a lot easier to write. And something that the last thing I'd like to discuss today is now what is effective stress now <coughs> with a tensor. If you remember at the beginning we started talking about total stress. And for that we use the letter S. And for example vertical stress was the weight of all the rock on top including fluids including everything that was total stress but now I have started to use uh, sigma and uh, if you remember we also defined what was effective vertical stress which was the total vertical stress minus the pore pressure well you can extend that 
equation and say that the effective stress tensor, or in general just effective stress, is going to be equal to total stress, but now we have for example, vertical, but also we have horizontal stresses and we have shear stresses. All of that <coughs> minus pore pressure. But the key here to consider is that the shear stresses are not going to be affected by pore pressure. So as a result, the effective stress tensor, when you go from total stress to effective stress, you just need to subtract pore pressure from the diagonal, not from the off-diagonal terms. And there is a reason for that. And the reason is that when, for example, you increase pore pressure in a rock, you're going to produce a change of volume of the rock. But you will not produce a shear strain. Uh, it will be very unlikely, almost impossible, that by compressing a rock, let's say imagine a rock that you put inside a pressure vessel and you increase the pressure a lot. Why would the, the rock shear? Why would it distort in shape? It's going to decrease its size, but it's not going to get subjected to shear because pressure just acts normally um, on a solid. And because pressure just acts normally on a solid, it just produces normal strains. And because of that, the effective stress is just going to be affected on the normal stresses and not on the shear uh, stresses. And this is very important because uh, now that we get to talk about stress in three dimensions, uh, we want to make sure that when we start utilizing the equations that we just saw before, relating stresses and strains, we have to use in this equation the effective stresses and not the total stresses. That's why I have here sigma and I don't have s. What it really makes the rock deform is going to be the effective stress and not the total stress. And because of that, when I use these equations, then I cannot use directly the total stress, but I need to subtract the pore pressure to it uh, in order to be able to use these new equations that we have right now that relate stresses to strain. And uh, if you were to use total stress, you will get the wrong answer. Uh, it's really effective stress what makes the rock deform and what makes the rock uh, fail in shear or get distorted. Uh, it's not going to be total stress. It's going to be effective stress. So it's very important that we consider pore pressure. And that's what we're going to do uh, next week. So we're going to use an example in which out of the total vertical stress, we compute effective vertical stress. And with that effective vertical stress, we get to the equations that for first time are going to tell us, just let me scroll to the bottom, let us calculate for first time what are the effective horizontal stresses as a function of deformations and as a function of overburden that is going to help us calculate the stresses in a formation like this where the rock varies as a function of depth. But we'll do that next week. All right? OK. Uh, one more thing, guys, before I forget. Uh, let me check the laboratory. Uh, laboratory, laboratory. OK, no, you don't have a laboratory next week, but we have one the week after. All right? OK. See you guys. Have a good day.